lover in the story, but the story's still the same. There's a lullaby for suffering and a paradox to blame. I didn't know I had permission to murder and to maim. You want it darker. We kill the flame. Hello and welcome back to the Evolution of Horror. My name is Mike Munzer, as ever, I am your host. If you're tuning in for the first time, then welcome. Usually on this podcast, we explore and dissect the history and the evolution of the horror genre by looking at particular subgenres one series at a time. Now, we are currently in the middle of our eighth series, exploring the evolution of the vampire movie, and a new episode in that vampire series drops every Friday. But this week, we're also bringing you a little bonus episode, because this week week sees the UK release of the new movie by Luca Guadagnino, Bones and All. I saw Bones and All at the London Film Festival at its UK premiere um, a couple of months ago, and I absolutely loved it. For me, it's one of my favourite films of the year. Now, I don't know whether we'd necessarily call Bones and All a pure horror film. That is up for discussion, which we will be talking about throughout this episode. But I do think that it dabbles in some really powerful and really effective horror. And it does have some pretty extreme stuff going on. But as with so many of Luca Guadagnino's brilliant films, it almost kind of defies genre in that way. So I'm here today to talk all about the movie in depth. So the way this episode is going to work, first of all, me and my guest are going to talk about our initial reactions and thoughts to the film completely spoiler free so the first section of the episode will be a completely spoiler free chat about the film then you're going to hear a little bit of my interview with the screenwriter David Kajanich uh, and that interview is also pretty much spoiler free and then after the interview we will give you a spoiler warning and me and my guest will be discussing bones and all in spoilerific details so if you haven't seen the film and don't want to be spoiled you can listen to everything up to the end of my interview with David but first, let's start with our initial thoughts about Bones and All. So joining me to discuss Bones and All, uh, she is a regular contributor here on the Evolution of Horror. She's the host of the Thirst podcast, and she's pretty much the biggest fan I know of both Luca Guadagnino and Timothy Chalamet. Steph McKenna, welcome back. Hi, Mike Munzer. Hi again. Well, hi again. This is nice. I, I mean, I had to have you back, partly because we both saw this film roughly the same time and both loved it, but also like, who else? was I going to come and get to talk about <laughs> Timothy Chalamet, right? Luca Guadagnino. So, so embarrassing. No, I'm not embarrassed at all. But I did think, I was like, God, these people, it's going to be a bunch of people listening to that Twilight episode and then being like, God, she's being brought on for the Timothy Chalamet episode as well. Like, was she 14? I am, in fact, a grown adult. If you had to choose one, Timothy Chalamet or Harry Styles? <clears throat> Um, <laughs> I'm going to go Timothy Chalamet today. Okay. All right. Yeah. Nice. I swear to God, I am an adult. Like I have a functioning <laughs> job and I, there's like some parts of my personality that are almost cool, but I also have this like thing where I, I just understand teenage girls. Hey, Timothy Chalamet and Harry Styles are super cool. That's the one thing they are is cool, <laughs> it's right? Like, uh, sent I, you that screenshot earlier on WhatsApp of a conversation. And I was like, sorry, just ignore the picture of Harry Styles in the background. For so God's funny. Sake. Is that just your constant background of WhatsApp? Just Harry yeah. Styles <laughs> lounging. I love it. It was so good. So uh, we are here to talk about Bones and All, which is finally out in the cinema because we saw this at London Film Festival. And that feels like quite a while ago now, right? <laughs> it was like... <laughs> It was like two months ago. Two months ago. ago. But, yeah. I mean, I have to say for a film that we did see a number of weeks ago, mm. I'm surprised at how many details I could recall, which is quite rare for me. I think I have the memory of a goldfish usually. So I felt like that was a good indicator that this, for the most part, this film sort of sank pretty deep with me. Like I could remember quite a lot. So I thought, hmm, it's kind of stayed with me a lot. Agreed. Agreed. So as this film is so new and a lot of people haven't seen it, what I thought we'd do mm. is we'll, we'll talk for the first kind of 10, 15 minutes, just spoiler free, just our initial kind of reactions to the film generally um, before we get into specifics. So I won't ask too much about the plot itself or anything at this stage because I think the part of the fun of this film is kind of discovering what this film is and where it goes you know oh yeah um but first question is what generally did you think of it are you were you a fan of this film I kind of loved it mm -hmm. but 
it was such a Steph specific formula. I all, it, it was almost guaranteed that I would enjoy it unless something went horribly wrong, which thankfully it didn't. But it's, yeah, it's Luca Guadagnino. Um, obviously, it's Timothy Chalamet. The supporting cast in this are so strong. The genre, the fact that it's Luca doing another horror film, um, the composers behind it, it all adds up to just kind of like... Steph Bingo. Uh, yeah. It is. It is like the Steph Bingo card. But um, I don't know, I guess... On the surface of things, a kind of cannibal love story sounds kind of silly. Like it's, you know, you've got one of society's greatest taboos and then the high drama of first love. And I could almost imagine that it would it, it would be kind of like one of those other YA stories. Kind of like when we spoke recently about Twilight, like a bit intense, but could be a bit silly. Um, but I don't know, through the kind of... I mean, it makes sense having that young love and the cannibalism because it's, I mean, what's more, what's more intense than, uh, what says intense and intimacy more than eating another than person? Than eating each other, exactly. Right? I, There's no other way to tell someone that you desire them physically more than wanting to eat their arm. <laughs> exactly. But that's true. And actually there are... It is in a lot of, you know, there's 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 a fine line between cannibalism and vampirism in film, right? It is almost a vampire film. And actually, in a lot of ways, this is the movie that I sort of wish Twilight was a little bit more. Totally. You know, this kind of like, like you say, a sort of slightly angsty, a bit emo love story. Yes. That also involves, you know, one person wanting to eat another potentially. Uh, but, but yeah, like that is, that's all there in Twilight. But uh I liked this a hell of a lot more than Twilight. <laughs> I it's, loved this. It's a, it's a lot better, isn't it? I mean, I think it's <laughs> it's the power of the performances and the setting and the cinematography and the score. It kind of strikes that balance between the sort of competing and connecting ideas of sort of physicality and emotion and sort of attraction and repulsion and love and horror. It's kind of, it's gentle and it's violent mm-hmm. and it kind of... it. It basically made me cry and it made me want to vomit at the same time. I so I, 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 I loved it and I felt deeply disgusted and frightened by it too. What a, an amazing thing, right? And I think it's really hard to even put this in a genre. Obviously, I'd call it a horror film and, and I'm sure a lot of people would, but then not everyone because it is also like we've talked about a romance, mm. a coming of age story, a road movie. It's all these other things. And you're right, like the fact that this movie is sweet and tender and romantic, but also gross <laughs> and disturbing and upsetting and horrific. And it's all of these things in one very successfully, mm. which is pretty amazing, I think, you know? I think so. I am so, I was so glad that we both came out of it yeah. loving it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was slightly worried about feeling, I don't know, slightly cold to it or I don't know. Um, I've got, a, I have a good track record with Luca's stuff. Like I do really love his stuff. So, it, you know, the odds were in my favour, but you just never know, do you? It's a, it's a tricky balance, tricky subject. And I just, I'm so pleased we both came out loving it. Me too. So let me start off by asking you about Luca. Luca Guadagnino, the director of this movie, um, obviously like very well known for previous movies he's done, like Call Me By Your Name, a bigger mm. splash. I always think of like sumptuous locations filled with gorgeous people, right? Beautiful music, beautiful cinematography. But then he also has dabbled in horror, obviously with his Suspiria remake as well. Yeah. He did that TV show, We Are Who We Are. Is that what it was called? We Are Who yes. We Are? Yes. Um, yes. Which we were both fans of too. Loved it. We? I loved it. Yeah, 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 yeah. What What is it about Luca's work that kind of really gets you, do you think, and strikes a chord with you? I mean, it, it it does almost sound like two different uh, filmographies, doesn't it? You've got this director yeah. of um, the the trilogy of desire is what he calls it. It's, yeah, I am love, a bigger splash and finally call me by your name. And as you say, they're very, they're beautiful. They're sun kissed. Mm. Um, you know, they feel very warm. They're set in Italy. And then he kind of... Well, it felt like a, you know, went on a detour and yeah. did this remake of Suspiria um, and now doing a cannibal film. But I mean, thematically and in terms of the characters he likes to create, I feel like it does make sense because his films are all very, his films are all very kind of intimate, whether it's about the intimacy between sort of two lovers or bonds between parents and children. Mm. Um he he talks about that intimacy and those those bonds between people and he talks a lot about desire and loss and sort of 
belonging and displacement, yes. um, adolescence, sort of coming coming of age narratives. And he's fascinated by the body. You get those kind of bodies stretched out on sun lounges in a bigger splash or yes. you know, like statues. And then, I mean, that lends itself so easily to body horror. So when he, when he, when he first adapted to Spirit, it was kind of like, oh, of course he's fascinated and mm-hmm. kind of, yeah, repulsed and delighted by this. Totally makes sense. So again, it's sort of... It it, it it lends it the cannibal story sort of oddly lends itself to his style of the things that he's passionate about and his style of filmmaking. Yeah, I agree. And and even though his films all look stunning, there is all there is an element of kind of weird tension in some of his films. Like mm. maybe not call me by your name. That is probably the most kind of I don't know sort of optimistic or celebratory, and th- th- there's nothing yeah. too uh, dark in that film. But a bigger splash has some quite dark stuff towards the end, doesn't it? Uh, you know, it, it goes it to is, some quite yeah. dark places. Obviously, Suspiria, We Are Who We Are, the, his TV show. I don't know if you felt this, but I always felt like something bad was going to happen to some of these characters yeah. at any given moment, you know? Um, and that's really interesting. And Absolutely. And I spoke with the writer, David Kajanic, um, about this, about because he wrote the screenplays previously for Luca's other films, A Bigger Splash and Suspiria. And those two films in particular, and then obviously this one, Bones and All, have that vibe, like... Yes, we're we're in this lovely place filled with lovely people, but maybe there is something quite sinister just around the corner, right? And he really goes, he doubles down on that in this film, I think. Yeah, you know? absolutely. You're right. This film has that as well. And it's not just because it's, you know, a film about cannibals, but you've got this kind of... The, the setting of the sort of American Midwest, you know, with the with the fields and the corn. And again, it feels quite um, a bit sun-kissed and, yeah. you know, it's sort of remote farming lands, big stretches of landscape. It's kind of like a painting. It's kind of a bit dreamy and it feels a bit sort of lulls you in. It's a bit safe. But also that's kind of a creepy setting as well. Like yes. anything could happen when you're out in the middle of nowhere and you've got these long stretches of road with kind of towns, just tiny towns interspersed and these, you know, very odd people kind of living on the fringes of society. And again, you're really exposed. You're really out there. Anything could happen at any time. So I felt quite on edge watching this Mm -hmm. film. I agree. Pretty much solidly. I agree. I love and I love that kind of feeling where you you almost don't really trust the film. You don't know where it's going to take you at any given moment. And we'll talk about specifics when we get to spoilers. But there's a moment in like the first 15 minutes when I just gasped because I I almost forgot what film I was in. And then something happened and I couldn't believe what I was seeing, you know. So it's I love those moments. Absolutely. Yeah, really, really good. The audience reaction, the audience reaction to that as well. You have to, I think seeing this in a cinema is worth it because Mm -hmm. the 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 reactions of the people around me when yeah that moment in particular happened I mean people were like absolutely flabbergasted and there was just a lot of noise people crawling over their seats I love the idea that a lot of people will go to see this thinking it's the new Timothy Chalamet movie by the guy that made call me by your name and just be completely shocked by what they see right, right? it's so funny <laughs> it's kind of delightful isn't it I mean it it, it worked I, it was everything I'd hoped for but you're right there's going to be a whole generation of young youngsters in particular who are going to come for this coming of age love story and it is it absolutely is that um sort of first and foremost i think really but there are some absolute shockers in this that you just, yeah and <laughs> you do not see coming and apparently there were a lot of disappointed teenage girls when this premiered at london film festival because initially it didn't have a certificate and the bbfc have since given it an 18 certificate which is quite oh, yeah. quite unusual these days to get an 18 certificate film in the uk right and uh, yeah. and it has to be pretty extreme and this film is and so there was a whole whole bunch of you know of teenage girls who were no longer allowed to see the movie and everything as well so you've totally reminded me that i saw this at london film festival at the the gala the red carpet gala and um we got that email the day before or whatever to be like yo by the way this is an 18 so bring your id and i was like wow truly pays to be an old lady sometimes yes exactly you'd be very frustrated if you were a a, a 15 year old timothy stan right so yeah (laughs) um and let's talk about this The, the other thing that is kind of amazing about this film is is it's got a 
pretty epic cast, hasn't it, as well? It's like a really stacked cast, as well as Timothy Chalamet. You've got Taylor Russell, Mark Rylance, Michael Stuhlberg, Andre, uh, Andre Holland, Chloe Sevigny, David Gordon Green is in this, Jessica Harper. <laughs> like, it's quite a cast, isn't it? It is. Uh, it's legends only i would say like there's no one there's no one that you're like eh in this and also everyone gives like such a great performance yeah. um taylor russell is i guess taylor russell's kind of a, a, a she's a, a relative newbie isn't she mm. she's been in waves um i think that's the only thing i kind of know her from yeah. timothy's obviously quite a, a big star but they you know they have such amazing chemistry in this and they are such they are so amazing as the sort of two the two main characters although um i think there's almost a risk of lee timothy as lee stealing the show a bit in this film because he's such a charismatic character yeah and he's sort of quite scrappy and extroverted whereas Marin, who's played by taylor russell is sort of more thoughtful and introverted yeah but i think Chalamet has a really good um, knack for sort of allowing a slightly more subtle performance to come to the front. She's, Taylor's performance is so striking and beautiful and he kind of compliments that rather than hogging the spotlight, I think. But one of the things that... Uh, uh, those two performances are really striking, but I was just so surprised that coming away from this film, some of the bits I kept thinking about and remembering were those supporting cast members <laughs> yes the sort of the michael stuhlberg as jake as you said um even andre holland as Marin's father who we don't see much of at all i love andre holland i think so he's good. great yeah. i wish we'd i wish we'd had more of him actually but yeah yeah chloe sevigny absolutely mortifying oh my god, oh um, my god. and mark rylance as and, well, well, and we'll talk about him more in spoilers but unbelievable but you're right i mean apart from our lead couple all these other people basically get like a set piece each, right? It's 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 sort yeah. of like they get a little scene. And th this is something you'll hear in my interview with the screenwriter, David Kajanich, but he said that the film was so hard to market and to fund because it's such a weird, dark, twisted story. Like, mm. no studio went for it. Like, it was completely independently funded ah. by them. And that most of the actors and yeah. collaborators that signed on basically were happy to do it without a fee. Um, so a lot of these people... Oh, yeah. A lot of these people yeah. just signed on to do it without taking a fee, I think, with a promise of profit share or something like that. And that was it kind of thing. So mm. it was just sort of like all on good faith from all of these people that I think just wanted to work with Luca and David on this film, which is amazing, really, you know, considering how many people are involved. That's stunning, really. Yeah, and the calibre of... I mean, these aren't, like... These are A-list celebrities. They could cash a big cheque if they wanted to, and you're right, that that's kind of testament to the project and the director and everyone who was on board, that these big names were like, no, I'm willing to give my time to this for basically for free. That's yeah, I hadn't realised that about a lot of the cast. So that's that's really fascinating. And then as if that wasn't enough, Steph, you've got Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross, right? Doing oh, the music. God <laughs> just absolutely finished me off when that got announced. I was like, ah it's oh truly lost my mind. Um and it 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 doesn't doesn't feel like their kind of score you've got this you know it's a road trip movie so you have this almost kind of like tender acoustic -y feel it feels like a blossoming love story and the sort of the journey through the sunny cornfields and you get this amazing ballad as well from Resna, which is yeah. you, know, you don't get that often so I mean absolutely bawling but then there are also these kind of as the film progresses the score has these kind of darker creepier moments that sounds more like a kind of clock ticking or something kind of gathering momentum to mm -hmm. some kind of horrible horrible climax it's yeah it's it's a gorgeous score um and also the soundtrack is so great too guadagnino is kind of known for he's great great for needle drops and this is kind of full of full of bangers it's like one of those spotify playlists that you really want to go and sort of download and listen to afterwards yeah and there is always that sort of classic scene he loves dancing, right? Luca Guadagnino loves dancing as well in every single film. Of course, Suspiria, but mm. bigger, A Bigger Splash has a very iconic Ray Fiennes dancing sequence. Obviously, Call Me By Your Name has that famous Army Hammer dance. Mm. And then this movie too, there's a moment when they go back to Lee's house, put on some tunes, and Lee does just this kind of like very Luca Guadagnino-esque flailing, <laughs> flailing dance like nobody's watching kind of thing, right? And it's like... Yeah, yeah. it's to, to kiss, lick it up. It's that's such it, a, that's it, yeah. Such a joyful, such a strange but joyful moment and yeah and I think the soundtrack is not too on the nose you know we I mean we've had so many 
properties recently especially you know netflix shows that Mm -hmm. kind of set in the 80s and they're super 80s it's like everything about it screams 80s and it's it's a lot subtler than that but you've still got that that kind of tie to setting and time and place so good isn't it um and uh i mentioned i mentioned army hammer just now and i feel like there is this slight elephant in the room that i should i I just want to mention because isn't is this not quite a strange (laughs) coincidence right that the the guy that made Call Me By Your Name with Timothy Chalamet and Army Hammer has since made a cannibal love story with Timothy Chalamet. Like, is that not quite a, co- a coincidence? It's either, like, the best coincidence ever <laughs> or the worst, but kind of knowing you can kind of, you can absolutely tell that Luca Guadagnino, like, fucking hates being asked about it. I bet oh, he's, God, yeah. like, people are briefed all the time, like, do not bring up the army thing. But, I mean, it's a hell of a... It's a hell of a coincidence, isn't it? I wonder if he'll go and see it. Will Army go and see this? Oh my god, I bet he won't. I bet he won't. Because just imagine what if people spot him walking into a cinema and buying a ticket for Bones at all. <laughs> just like eating some chicken wings or something at the time. <laughs> god, like, oh, it's it's god, so it's... dark, isn't it? But I think you're right. Like, yes, apparently he has got Luca has got quite annoyed in Q and A's and things like that when people ask him and he's like, What a ridiculous question. Of course it has nothing to do with Army Hammer. But it must have gone through his mind while he was in the process of making this film right that people might ask him that (laughs) i just like the idea of him getting annoyed because he's a man that gets annoyed at everything anyway but i just you just wouldn't want to cross him ever you wouldn't fuck with this guy but no i wonder if he was like "Mm, is the timing right for this but yeah maybe it is it kind of maybe it is some extra publicity maybe it is um and let's just finish by quickly and again we won't go into details or specifics but in terms of the cannibalism How did you find that? Because I often find this is one of the things that I've talked about a lot on this podcast, but cannibalism still feels like it's one of the last real taboos, even in horror cinema. You know, like it's still the thing that really shocks people over anything else, I think. And it really grosses people out. You know, there were stories when um, Julia DeCorno's film Raw premiered that people were fainting and being carried out of the (laughs) cinema and all that kind of thing. And I can imagine that sort of reaction for this film too. But but how did you find the the cannibalism in this movie? You're right. It is, it is the ultimate taboo, isn't it? Yeah. I don't know whether it's because it's so grounded in reality. Like that's something that could happen, yeah. guys. Like you might actually be that hungry one day that it kind of freaks people <laughs> yeah. out. But um, it's having a moment as well. You've had kind of like, you know, you said raw and fresh that yes. came out this year. Yellow jackets. Like mm-hmm. we're obviously fascinated and it's kind of got this... It's, it's fascinating to me because you've got cannibalism as a kind of, you know, a last act of desperation, like it's repugnant, it's the, lo- you know, you do it to survive. Mm-hmm. Or it's kind of like this ho- hobby of the upper classes. Yes. <laughs> like yes. Silence of the Lambs or, yeah, in, in, in Fresh. But I mean... Generally, I wouldn't. I personally wouldn't flock to see a cannibal film. No, but um, and it's 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 pretty violent actually. But in a kind of, as you said, like an almost unsuspecting way. Like you know, it's a cannibal film, mm-hmm. but it is a love story and it's a coming of age drama. And you're almost lulled into this sense of sort of not expecting the moments of violence that do suddenly happen. Yeah. And it's, it's so deeply disgusting to experience. <laughs> and I was trying to work out why this was more uncomfortable and disgusting to me than some of the really extreme films that I've watched. And I guess it's... Agreed. I mean, firstly, it's the sound editing. The sound editing in this is mad, isn't it? Like oh it's... My God. You can hear the you can hear the gristle yes. and like the bones snapping. It's you cannot escape it even if you close your eyes. Yes, um, But I guess it's also... It is kind of so realistic because it's... It's like the seriousness and the intimacy of those moments kind of makes it more mm-hmm. stomach churning. Does that make sense? There's yeah. kind of a yeah, I agree. And there's something you know in Suspiria, for example, the gore is so over the top that it's oh. kind of op- operatic. Yeah, but but yeah. in this film, there's something more low key and um, sort of. I don't know, almost mundane, a matter of mm. fact about it. Like in my head, I don't know if I'm remembering this wrong, but in a lot of the moments of horror, there's actually no score or music. Like it's just mm. happening. And it's like, oh my God, you know, there's there's something even more shocking about that, I think. Um, yeah. And yeah, it reminded me more of, yeah, like less like a movie like, you know, Cannibal Holocaust or, so, or, <laughs> exactly. or Texas Chainsaw Massacre. It's less that, but it's more like, yeah, raw 
or Trouble Every Day. And these are the movies mm-hmm. that I find more disturbing in a way because there's something kind of like realistic and matter of fact about it. Yeah, you know? and I felt like I, I, because it is so intimate and it feels so deeply personal, I think Luca had said something in an interview about... Um, that in those moments there's such a there's a lot of pain in those characters and it's mm. a kind of it's kind of a sacred moment when they're eating so it's not a it's not a moment of gluttony or sort of excess it's this intimacy between like the eater and the eaten and these people sharing a mm. meal so it kind of feels like you shouldn't be allowed to see it because it's quite private so that kind of yes. made it feel harder to watch as well like I was being brought in to view something that wasn't for me to see agreed completely agree and I think there's some really interesting obviously like metaphors at play and maybe we can talk about them that more when we go into spoilers as well but um but yeah maybe we should leave the spoiler free chat at that um and then we'll go into more specifics but I guess final question is do you recommend people go and see this at the cinema now that it's out this week? Oh, totally. You have to go and see it in the cinema. <laughs> you have to. Just for the bone snapping and the crunching and the <laughs> those shock moments, yeah. if anything. And also to have a good cry. Yeah. Remember what it's like for a first love. It's, it's so funny. Well, those feels, man. That's I love lot. that. Even those sentences, Steph, like, go see it for the bone crunching, but also <laughs> to have a good cry about first love. And like, Do you know what? Is... I love a good cry at the cinema. It's basically why I go to the cinema. Is for that yeah. sense of like have a good sob in the back row. I do that all the time, and I definitely did it with this. So I think it's one to see. And those, and I mean, actually, the cinematography and the landscapes and the yes. it is beautiful to see as well. So seeing it on a big screen is kind of a must. I think I agree. I loved it. This will be, I think, probably in my like top ten movies of the year. I really, really loved it, and I'm I'm really excited to watch it again already. And I Me too. I can't wait for more people to see it and to hear more people's thoughts on it as well. You know, because I just feel like this is a film that people are going to be talking about for a while, you know, because it is shocking. It is genuinely shocking. Yeah, yeah. You When you least expect it, there's some real moments of like genuine horror. I love it. Well, shortly, we're going to move into our spoilerific discussion of the film. But first of all, let's play some of my interview with the screenwriter of Bones and All, David Kajanic. Now, David has worked with Luca Guadagnino a couple of times already. He was the screenwriter of A Bigger Splash and the screenwriter of Suspiria 2018. So him and Luca have had a bit of experience together in writing these strange, weird, genre-defying, transgressive movies. Uh, not only that, David was one of the writers and developers of the hit TV show The Terror, which is a brilliant show, very dark, very scary, uh, and also a bit of cannibalism going on in that first season of The Terror as well. So I sat down in a posh hotel room during the London Film Festival with David Kajanic to discuss all things Bones and All. David, hello. How are you hello. doing? I'm well. How are you? I'm very good, thank you. Yeah, good. How has your uh, London trip been so far? Surreal, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> the, the, the amount of people we saw the film with yesterday, yeah. I've not seen it in a crowd that big. I don't expect to see it in a crowd that big again. Uh-huh. And it was a total delight to just be in the crowd through, through the screening, gauging what people were reacting to. It was fantastic. I'm really intrigued to know how people are reacting to this film as well, because it's such an unusual story and kind of mix of genres almost, it feels like. How was the kind of audience reaction yesterday? Well, it, uh, so the film turns a lot. Yeah. tone to tone and genre to genre. And so I was trying to pay closest attention to when I thought people seemed um, um, contemplative, you know, yeah. sort of. And, and, and if they leave the film that way, which if if they do, then I think we've done our jobs well. But um, I also wanted to see how the jump scares landed. There aren't many in this film and they're yeah. not. I, th- I, I think that you sort of can see everything coming. So if someone's concerned about going to see a film where you're too surprised, I mm-hmm. think I don't think this is it. I think you've got plenty of warning. But I wanted to see. Um, yeah, I wanted to see when when it seemed that people were 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 moved, because I think that's the surprising thing about this film for a lot of people is that it's some, somehow warmer than one thinks a film about this subject could be. Absolutely. And so it was it was interesting to talk to people after the screening who were leaving feeling that they had seen a love story as opposed to a horror film, which is, of course, what we hope happens. That's really interesting. So do you see this, uh, you know, do you see this as a horror film, this movie? I, no, I don't personally. I see that we've employed a horror grammar at times. Yeah. And I see that the central metaphor in the film that is cannibalism in this case, it's certainly a horror trope. And it there's... 
you know, a fair amount of visual disclosure about it in the film. Yes. So, <laughs> yes, you would have to say this has elements of horror in it. But I but I structurally, tonally, I don't I don't see it that way. And it didn't I didn't read the book that way. I didn't feel that way when I was writing the script. Um, and I don't feel that way when I see the film. So tell us a little bit about this kind of process of how you came to to this project and, and you know, discovering the novel and adapting it for the screen. Yes, it was sent to me uh, out of the blue by a producer I'd never met before and who, who wrote a, an, a note just saying, I thought of you for this. And when that happens, I, you, yeah. I take that seriously. I, I don't take that for granted. And read the book and was surprised to find that it was really the coming of age story of a young woman. And so my, it, it's, it's worth saying that my response to that was that I wanted to make sure that the author of the book was, was fine with a man writing the screenplay, because right. even though the book is about cannibalism, it's, it felt personal to me. And, you know, when mm -hmm. you start to deconstruct what that metaphor might mean, you know, I, I wanted to make sure that, that I had permission. And uh, so I, I had a couple of lovely talks with the author of the book. And when I explained how I, how I had read the book, it was in line with what she cared about most about making the adaptation. So it, you know, I proceeded with her blessing and then it became a very interesting challenge to try to understand how to take a book with the tone that the book has, which is a kind of fairy tale tone, how to translate that in, into a visual medium mm. where we weren't going to be able to treat some of these subjects in such a, um, let's say poetic as opposed to naturalistic way. Mm -hmm. When you point a camera at something, you have to point it at something specific. And so I knew that we were probably talking about a hard R film, which <laughs> in itself is an interesting um, pivot away from uh, the YA genre because the very audience for the book technically probably <laughs> isn't able to see this film for yes. a number of years. But, you know, I mean, on the one hand, anyone can see anything anymore uh, yeah. if they really want to. But uh, and it's not to say that I'm advocating for <laughs> children to go and see this film. But when it's when it is finally time for a young person to see this film, it just feels to me like we retained the intention of the book. Uh, but we just simply had to be a bit more candid in a visual language than the book needed to be. So we're in a weird spot of being. For, for maybe for both adults and, and younger people, maybe it's that kind of film. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. And of course, then you need that kind of a director with that kind of poetic, uh, I think, kind of visual eye, I think that, that and Luca is so perfect for this. Obviously, you and Luca have worked together a couple of times before. What, what do you think makes, you know, Luca such a perfect director for a story like this? And, and you guys always seem to work so well together in these projects to create these kind of really interesting um, sort of uh, unique films. And what do you think it is about the two of you working together that kind of works? I, well, we've done such different things, even just yeah. since three films, but each is so st strangely different from the other. I mean, I, I think it's two things. I think the reason we sort of can harmonize together is because we both have, I think, very humanistic priorities. You know, yeah. I think we both understand our jobs respectively as being, you know, in some way about building empathy. Mm. In the scripts, I tend to take a very practical approach and in directing he tends to take I, I i won't use the word operatic because that's not i don't think he would like my using that word but he, you know, he really takes risks visual risks and big swings and yeah. and i think the combination of that practicality that that grounds the the stories we tell together you know is sort of in terms of the characters and their motivations and all those things and then the 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 frenetic visual language that he brings to it it's they're not they're somehow not at odds mm -hmm. you know one one each one sort of um both tames and unleashes the other in some way so it's even we are surprised sometimes at <laughs> how somehow it's a, a, the tricky tone of something like this film or a bigger splash or suspiria it, la it lands and mm. we're, so every time we have a successful uh, collaboration we want to do it again because i don't know something between us fits yeah there is this really wonderful mix i find of kind of beauty with a sort of sense of dread even in a bigger splash i felt that you know that for the most part nothing you know quote unquote her too horrific happens you know for the most part um but there is this kind of constant feeling like maybe something bad is just around the corner and of course the spirit has a <laughs> yeah. lot of that um but do you kind of you know that obviously comes through in the filmmaking but also the script right and is that something that you kind of intentionally weave in when you're writing these films sure uh, you know luca 
one of the things that I enjoy, one of the many things I enjoy about working with Luca is he's so unafraid of, uh, of switching genres, even even mid scene. And so, you know, when you're talking about you know how how he controls that or how I, I control that, it, it's in in some way it's just about deciding that what we're doing isn't for the audience in in, in a very specific way. Mm. We're not we're not extending a hand, whether that's through exposition in the script or whether that's through a kind of editing that makes things more comfortable for an audience. Neither one of us is interested. It's almost as if we have to ignore the fact that there will be an audience in order yeah. in order to give the audience a maximum amount of credit. And I think, you know, eat, eat, I think we give each other pep talks about that all the time, you know, to not when he sees me sort of almost make a choice that would be for the audience or I see him, we call each other out sometimes. And it ends up being a really lovely way to stay true to mm -hmm. you know to sort of a, a point of view about um giving the audience imagining the audience is a very intelligent one how does the process work for you once you've written the script are you kind of still involved were you on set for this or is it just kind of like handing it over and, and leaving it to luca luca is uh, a rare bird in the respect that he unlike any other director I've worked with really is adamant about the writer staying involved, or at least w between the two of us. And so we talk a lot before I write a script, um, not in this case because I brought this to him, but but in, in the past, so that when I write the script, he knows exactly what I'm doing because mm -hmm. we've discussed everything. I hand him the script. He says, I'm a fan. Let's make this. Uh, and we really don't change the script very much until it's cast. Mm -hmm. And that's because the collaboration extends then to the cast. And so we sit down with all the actors and ask them about their questions about the script, their thoughts, their insights. We make little tweaks here and there and, and really sort of make it a tailor it to the people who are, in fact, going to play these parts. And maybe occasionally on set, uh, something will happen that will require a little rewrite or something like that. But, mm -hmm. but for the most part, we stick with whatever that first draft was as much as we can. And, and Luca is so welcoming to have me on set. I'm usually sitting next to him during the shoot. Great. I'm in casting sessions sometimes. I'm in ADR sessions. Uh, I write all the ADR. I'm in the editing room. It's a, a kind of access to the process that when I tell other screenwriters about my experiences, I think they get, I mean, envious is, a, is an understatement, but I also think they get, they get a little frustrated and maybe angry that it, that it is so rare yeah. that the writer is um, deferred to at all, let alone through every stage of the process. Um, but Luke and I, because of that, we've just become friends. And now the point is that we are friends who like to spend time together. So yeah. it's no longer a sort of a strategic decision a director is making about keeping a resource close to him. Mm -hmm. It's just about now just having a, an opportunity to spend time together. That's great. Tell me a little bit about the casting process for this, isn't it? Because I think it's a really fascinating, you know, interesting ensemble cast of huge names that pop up in this movie throughout, right? And then also, you know, you've got this wonderful central couple in the middle of it as well. Tell me a little bit about casting those characters. Well, this film, uh, you may or may not know, but we we financed it completely independently. There mm. was no oversight of a of a of a, of a studio or, a, you know, a, a, no one was looking over our shoulder. And in order to make a film like this, which would have been very surprising to me that a, a studio might develop something this. Yes. I don't know what the right word is. I mean, people have said it's transgressive. I don't know that I would use that word because it but it's something it's dangerous somehow yeah. from a marketing point of view. Definitely. Yeah. Um, and so we just decided to pull our resources and and get collaborators who were so undeniably good, mm -hmm. you know, at their various jobs, whether we're talking about Trent and Atticus composing, whether we're talking about Timmy in the film and yeah. Mark Rylance and Nat Taylor, and, or we're talking about the department heads that Luca and I have worked with before. We just put together a team that was willing to bet on this project, which in many cases meant not taking a salary up front, but deferring that it in the event that the film was sold. And that is a very risky wow. proposition. And it almost never happens anymore. But in this particular case, we understood there wasn't going to be a way to make this unless it was a fairly starry package. Mm. And so when Timmy said yes, and Mark Ryland said yes, and Taylor said yes, it just kept giving us a real confidence about the fact that, yeah, we probably could win this, this sort of gambit. You know what I mean? That it, yeah. it might actually turn out all right, because we had so many interesting people saying, yes, I will, 
I will take a risk on this. Tim, uh, really great as well to see Timmy in this movie because, again, you know, I've, I've read, you know, this week it's been in the news that obviously all these poor <laughs> teenage fans of Timmy haven't been able to go and see this movie because they're under 18, right? Yeah. Which is really funny. So it's, it's, a, it's a different kind of film for him, right? Yeah. But was he kind of happy to just sort of dive into this subject matter? Yes. Not only was he happy to dive in, but in our early conversations about the script, uh, you know, the script is a, a number of genres sort of sat on top of one another. Yeah. And everything, you know, all the little things and, uh, that Timmy wanted to sort of massage in the script, they were actually all about removing additional protections mm. for his character. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so he knew full well in, in that process that he was making his character less and less, you know, sort of immediately appealing. Mm. And I just thought that was so mature uh, and brave and uh, I think necessary for someone who wants to actually do interesting work in his career instead of being perceived as a celebrity and being, you know, at some point you're only offered those parts after a while. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, and to see how someone his age was so wise about which walls in the script were load bearing and had to stay and which ones weren't. And I don't think he ever suggested a thing that wasn't both easily done and benefited sort of the integrity of the script. So it was really lovely to sort of have those conversations with him because he's so smart. Yes. And Mark Rylance, right? What a performer. <laughs> I just watched him on stage a few weeks ago and he was phenomenal. And then seeing him in a role like this, absolutely terrifying, yeah. right? But he must be great to watch on set. He never dropped that accent by the way so he was he performed the sully's accent uh, all over uh the you know the production whether he, you were standing in line for lunch or <laughs> and you know he understood the the part immediately also in a way that was so important that it be that it be played toward pathos instead of scariness right mm -hmm. i mean he is a very scary figure in the film but the reason that character is in the film and prominently in the film is because it's a sort of glimpse of what our two young lovers will be mm. in 30, 40, 50 years if they don't, if they can't find connections with other people. Yeah. And Mark, of course, is, you know, he's a kind of genius of evoking pathos, no matter what kind of character he's playing. Mm. Mm -hmm. So to be able to watch him take this part and pull every little bit of sympathy or empathy an audience member might have watching it. It was really, it was incredible to see that from five feet away. <laughs> I find like I'm you know this is a horror podcast and I've seen a lot of horror movies and I'm a pretty hardened horror fan but when I went to see this I was really shocked and almost had to look away at a couple of parts I loved it and <laughs> and I think you know what what is it about you know you, you've had some really gory you know body horror moments in Suspiria and that kind of thing but there is something about cannibalism specifically <laughs> I find when you look at some of the most taboo movies in cinema history and horror history often they deal with cannibalism it's still one of the most taboo subjects it feels like to tackle in genre films why do you think that is oh gosh I, I mean it, I've, I've now done I've done cannibalism. I don't want to say that. I have <laughs> featured it in two two projects I've worked on, and the first being the Terror, which was a, which was about an um, Arctic expedition yeah. that went badly, and it, we know from the archaeological record that it happened. And mm -hmm. so, you know, that project was really quite good training for this project because that project we because it was p actually part of the historical record. It was just about understanding how reasonable people could make that very unreasonable decision, mm. uh, and when I approached it in that project that way without any kind of fetishization or any kind of sensa sens sensationalization, mm. it, you start to understand the practicalities of it. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And, one, and I think once you've understood the practicalities of it, you can see why people are so afraid of it because in certain circumstances, it isn't hard. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? It, and in fact, it may in fact be the one, uh, the one best choice you can make. And so mm. it makes the whole thing feel like, well, the metaphor of it to some people in certain moments in history has crumbled and it's become the reality of it. And so mm -hmm. I just think there's something we like to think that there is an invisible line of protection around us, at least from other well-meaning people. Yes. But, but in certain <laughs> situations it isn't. And I was saying to a friend the other day that I think it's the weird kind of cannibalism boom that's happening in, yeah. <laughs> in art right now in cinema. I, I actually think it's a good sign because if you think about you know, how many years, you know, a decade or more we spent with zombies being the primary, yeah. you know, sort of trope of yeah. horror, which is dead people eating the living. I find living people eating the living to be something of a 
some pro- some kind of progress. You know? Yeah, right, right. It's true, and and but it, but yeah. Also, that's more disturbing. I think what's really interesting is that you know, yes, I know what you mean that this isn't you know this isn't just a pure horror movie. But I think by not making it a pure horror movie, it makes it even more of an uncomfortable horror experience. You it's, know what I, mean? I do, <laughs> and I I knew knew that intellectually writing the script. But once we were on set and actually seeing, you know, we shot this more or less in order, so yeah. we were following the, sort of the actors how they were how they were really galvanizing the character arcs and. There were there sure were moments on set where I was at the monitor thinking, wow, this really does this really does play differently. It really punches the heart yeah. in a way that I think a lot of horror movies don't even have the ambition to try to do because we were crossing so many genres. But would you call this a horror film? Primarily? I think I would personally. That's yeah. interesting. And I mean that as a compliment. You know, I absolutely loved it, but it made me feel so uh tense and uh and repulsed at points as well. You know, I think I can only call it a horror movie, amongst many other things, you know. Um, and what do you see as that metaphor? Like you say, I think what's really fascinating about it is that people can take different ideas from what this cannibalism represents in this film. When you were writing it, what kind of metaphors did you have in your head? Well, I, I, I had a very obvious one just on a personal level, which is that I grew up gay in the Midwest in a pretty rural place. And, you know, I could hide. Not everyone could or can, yeah. but I could. And so I was always aware that even though I wasn't pushed to the to the side, the way that I might have been. Otherwise, that was always one sort of, you know, kind of slipped moment away, right? Yeah. And and so I didn't want to project that in front of the, sort of the book, but I certainly felt the book in a way that I think a lot of people from a lot of different vectors can feel it because, you know, there are all kinds of ways we sideline people, we push them to the edge. We, you know, I mean, there are ways that we ignore people left and right. And I think you know, to tell a story like this about what it's like to live kind of pushed against the wall like that for mm. for one's formative years, or at least in the case of these characters, their formative summer. Um, I don't know. It, 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 I think the cannibalism allowed us to not have to, uh, I read somewhere, someone called it st- sort of engage in social tourism. Mm. And I like that phrase. I mean, I like the fact that someone thought we had avoided doing that because yeah. it's, you know, we didn't we didn't have to because the the meta the central metaphor is so strong, it it acts as a catalyst for the audience in a way that we didn't have to overly control mm-hmm. or curate, um, and so you know I if you'd asked me do you want to write a, a movie about cannibalism I would have said no right but if you told me if and someone finally did show me this book how it deploys cannibalism as just a kind of not allegory exactly, but it, but it's just sort of a fantastical catalyst for lots of subtext that we didn't necessarily have to name. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, finally, I just want to finish by asking you briefly about Suspiria, because I, what I find really interesting, you know, you mentioned this movie is kind of in some ways a difficult one to market. And I think it's going to be one of those that grows through word of mouth. I kind of have felt like that's happened with Suspiria. I don't know if you've experienced this, but I feel like there's a real community of horror fans and just movie fans in general that are really embracing that movie, maybe more than they did when it initially was released, you know? I don't know if you felt that yourself. And what do you think is the reason for that kind of growing appreciation for Suspiria? Well, I, I will say that in, yes, I I see more Suspiria tattoos that people want to show me. Right. You yeah. know, in the last year than I, than I did when the film came out. Well, I just think it's, you know, on, on one level, you know, that film wasn't heavily marketed. It wasn't in people's view very mm-hmm. much. It was in theaters, but only briefly. And, and then it was relegated to streaming where thousands and thousands of other things are. And I think it was hard to find, but through word of mouth, I think people who know that film might be interesting or useful or special to them, you know, that word gets through. And I quite like the idea of being a part of projects that take a while for their audience to find them, because I, I think that means that they must we must be doing something um, quite specific and subjective instead of something that's just meant to please people. And maybe that's worse for whoever's meant to be marketing and reaping all of the financial benefits of that. But um, I don't know. I like I like the projects that that have to take a minute for people to find them or for them to find people. Absolutely. David, we're out of time, but thank you so much for thank joining me. Thank you so much. Thank you. What a pleasure. And there we go. A big thank you to the writer, uh, the screenwriter of Bones and All, David Kajanic. Uh, so, Steph, we are going to get into spoilers now. So I will say from this point onwards, spoiler alert, we're going to reveal all plot details mm. all the way up until the end. Um, Steph, I think we should start at the beginning because... Mm. 
I was so shocked, as I already alluded to, at just everything that happens in that first 15 minutes. We're introduced to our main character of Marin. She's living with her dad. And I was kind of like, oh, this is weird. What? There are some shady goings on here. Why is the dad <laughs> locking her up in her bedroom at night? He's a bit overbearing. And I, I, yeah. I, just, I don't know why, but it didn't occur to me that she was the cannibal. I just, I had no idea that that's where this was going. For some reason in my head, I thought that Timothy Chalamet was going to be the cannibal and she was going to meet him and discover that. And... The yeah. moment when she goes to the girl's party, she sneaks off from her bedroom at night, she goes to meet this girl that she likes, they look like they're about to make out under the table, and then actually she just crunches, bites into her finger yeah. in such a violent, brutal way. I was sho- I gasped sh- at that moment. Like, shocking reality of her kind of condition. Yeah, you have this... I th- and I can't, I mean, it's, uh, you know, some people won't know Luca's work, but for me, I felt like it did play on my expectations of his work a little bit because mm. you have this, as you say, Marin's kind of, I don't know, sort of 16 ish. She's moved to the area with her dad and she's, you know, new to school and she's just making these friends. And there's this sense of something blossoming with this other young girl. Um, and they, she go, sneaks out to this sleepover, and she's obviously bonding with this person quite naturally. And they're growing; they're on the floor together, getting closer and closer. And you absolutely, you know, it's leading to something, but it's it's not that. <laughs> You're like, <laughs> no. it's it's this sense of connection and intimacy that you think, like, oh yeah, absolutely, you know where this is going. And it's a kind of beautiful mm-hmm. moment as well. It is really lovely. Um, and yeah, you're totally duped because she just crunches down. And the, oh my god! In the cinema, the audible gasp. But people were aghast. I was gleeful. It was brilliant. Yes. I know. But it's, I know. It kind of sets you up from the start, doesn't it? Because that's like the first few. That's the first few minutes. So it really sets you up to kind of understand that this is a film about, a, you know, a young a young girl who sort of quite introverted and alienated you know she doesn't understand herself her sort of true nature and she's she's battling with this there's this story of her you know um going on this big sort of personal journey to find her mum and find a sense of home Mm -hmm. but yeah it's also this story of (laughs) her quite literally not being able to fight the urge to eat other people yeah eat their faces off yeah and and you and we discover right that like she's done this before and that essentially Mm. she and her dad have been on the run they've been sort of drifting and moving from town to town because you get the impression this has happened before and the dad has to keep moving town and start a new school with her and that's why he locks her up in the bedroom but at this moment now that i think she's turned 18 right he basically decides enough is enough oh yeah and he completely leaves her and this is why we we get Andre Holland, who is not in the film very much, because after that first section, that's it. He's gone. And he leaves her completely to fend for herself. And this is when she goes off on this kind of road trip by herself. I I I guess, like, the initial conceit is she wants to go find her mother, right, who she's never met. Um, And... uh, who she suspects she got this <laughs> this this uh, affliction from right it it was passed down from her mother this uh, this cannibalism this desire to eat human flesh so she goes off on a journey on a bus to try and find her mum and then this is when this journey starts where she meets all of these like weird and wonderful characters along the way and the first person she meets it's like he seeks her out it's like he can smell her right is Sully played by Mark Rylance um, what what did you think of Sully and, and Mark Rylance's performance performance i think mark like rylance as sunny sully even sully not sunny is Mm. easily for me the most unsettling thing in this film and he does quite literally sniff her out he can smell her um as a fellow eater is what they call themselves eaters rather than cannibals um and i guess yeah there's this kind of um idea of you know are they are they sniffing each other out? Are they naturally drawn together because of, you know, their similar states? Or is he sniffing mm-hmm. her out almost as prey? Um, yeah. And his, his appearance is so freaky in this. And I almost can't, like the costume design is great because he has this kind of, it's kind of pieced together. He's got this, um, this like creased blue sort of like suit shirt. Then he's got like the fishing vest and then he's got yeah. the hat with the feather in it, which is such a tiny detail, the feather, but it's like oddly unnerving along with his sort of really long yeah. ponytail. And then he's he matches it with this kind of 
he's quite softly spoken and quite meek in a way, but he addresses himself in the third person mm-hmm. in a way that is so uncanny. Like, there's something so odd about it. He kind of tries to draw, I say tries to draw Marin in. That makes it sound like he's being a predator and we actually don't know. We kind of never learn. The film doesn't tell you outright what his motivations are, which is which is really important. But he's got this, mm. you know, he's got a lot to teach Marin. He can... He shows her that others like, you know, herself do exist because she's been existing in this kind of blank space where she doesn't know why she is the way she is and if there's anyone else like her. Um, And he shows her how to use her sense of smell and sort of shows her how he kills, which is by attacking people who are sort of about to to die anyway. Um, But yeah, there's something, something instinctively is not right. He's kind of telling her to stay away from other eaters like them in a way that's kind of he frames as if it's a, you know, because he fears for her, but there's almost a sense of possessiveness there from the very start. And it's, yes, it's not, I mean, it's obviously not appropriate. Like he doesn't, he either, well, he might not understand or he might well understand that, you know, a middle-aged man hanging out with a young girl like that is actually quite inappropriate and they can't stay Mm -hmm. and live together. But Mm -hmm. yeah, there's this sort of sense of like, is he just, an outsider, you know, on the fringes of society who kind of doesn't get those social cues or is he something else entirely? Yeah. And, you know, she's really right to trust her instincts. He's he's really hard to judge and that's what makes him so creepy. Completely agree. He's such a creepy character and you're right, he's such a mystery. Mark Rylance, and Mark Rylance is, is such a good actor. I mean, I especially love him in, in theatre. Sometimes in film... His, his performances can still be quite big and theatery, um, but I think it sort of works for this character because he is very larger than life. Like you say, the way he dresses, the way he talks about himself in the third person, he's so overtly creepy. <laughs> and yeah, I couldn't work out, and we never really know for certain whether you're right, like, was he? Does he look at Marin as kind of prey? Did he kind of have a sexual infatuation mm. with her? I mean, he follows her across the country as well. This is the terrifying thing: is yeah. that she keeps thinking she's gotten away from him. She's travelled to other states, and he still keeps turning up, following her. Right? And yeah, is it that he actually wants her in some sexual way, or is it just yeah that? finding another person like him is yeah. meant that he could actually have some company right and a companion yeah. or almost like a daughter figure who he can teach i don't know yeah. it's um it but either way it's terrifying and inappropriate it's... and the moment when <laughs> and like you said earlier when you were talking about what lucas said about these kind of moments of intimacy almost when they eat together but that's something these two share together right where they they eat this woman who's dead in this house where Sully is squatting together. And Sully sort of says, oh, I never usually share that with someone else. You know, it's a very intimate, personal moment. And the two of them kind of have this experience together. And that's when he becomes kind of obsessed with her almost, right? Yeah. But it's ve- it's so creepy. And the way that they're just covered in blood as well, it's so gross. They're kind of, it, it's like the polar opposite to when Marin's with Lee, right? It's kind of when they're mm. eating and feeding together. It's like, it's everything. Everything. It's like Sully in his pants. In his little pants. It's in his <laughs> little pants. What it look? It's just horrible. But yeah, there's this kind of feeling of um, that. It, I got, you get that sense of them sort of being animalistic in that moment, them feeding together. Where something there's something entirely different going on with Lee and Marin when they're feeding together. But mm. is it father and daughter? You know, is he looking for that kind of family? Because she's looking for a family as well. That's what she wants, and she's been looking for a. You know, she ha- she had a father figure, but her father literally abandoned her, which is horrific in and yeah. of itself. That he could just leave her that way. So is it that, or is this just proof of what? loneliness can do to a person like it can literally drive you to you know drive to the other side of you know the state because Mm -hmm. you want to be with this person that you have a connection with but he also kind of salivates over her in a really overtly it's just it's so so creepy and that moment when she gets away on the bus she manages to escape and she sees him out the window and he looks Mm -hmm. at her and his look is just it is sad, but it's also, it just looks furious. And it f- yes. freaked the fuck out of me. It's so scary, yeah. Because you know he's coming back. You just know he's coming back. Yeah, and, and that's, this is where the film really kind of teases you with these kind of things. Because some characters have one scene and then they never come back. But Sully mm-hmm. is the one that does keep coming back, right? And all the way up until that 
terrifying final sequence. But yeah, yeah, that look he gives her as she's driving away where he looks kind of hurt and shocked that she's done this to him, but also he looks angry as well. And it's like, oh, it is, yeah. it's a really chilling moment. Yeah, Mark Rylance, so good. Uh, David uh, Kajanich said in when I interviewed him that Mark Rylance stayed in character the whole time as well. He had that oh, voice no. even off off camera and stuff. Nope. <laughs> no, thank you, sir. No, thank that you. is so creepy. Salivating it's, during the uh, catering at lunch. <laughs> it's the drool. It's the drool. We'll get to it later. But there's a bit of drool in this film that has stayed with me for weeks. Yeah. It's just... It's Blah. unbelievable. Yeah. But then, of course, she goes off on the bus and this is where she meets lovely Lee, who in comparison, you lovely know, Lee. lovely Lee. I mean, yes, Lee eats people. But the first time we see him, right, he has this altercation with this guy in this like uh, liquor store type of place. Mm. Right. And then he that's the guy that he ends up eating. And you get the feeling that Lee kind of has a bit more of a sort of moral code almost or something like in who he chooses to eat. Um, but yeah, what, what did you think of Lee generally? And then this like this re- this relationship that blossoms between Marin and Lee? Yeah. So they they meet at this grocery store, as you say, and they're sort of drawn to each other instinctively. Um, mm. I guess probably also, you know, that eater's sense, mm-hmm. but also because um, Lee can sense that Marin is in danger and that he can provide a way out f- for her. Also, probably because they're both really beautiful. They're just like, hey, yes. you're hot, you're hot. Just two yeah. beauties. Um, but yeah, he's the kind of first person to protect Marin like that since her dad, basically. And he's, um, yeah, he feels kind of more attuned to the to the cannibal lifestyle, doesn't he? He's sort of like mm-hmm. a bit scrappy, a bit sort of maybe happy-go-lucky, sort of reminding me of like Lady in the Tramp or something. Like he's embraced yeah. his lifestyle as an outsider and he kind of knows he can turn on the charm to get what he wants he's got that mm-hmm. sort of mullet hairdo the hair dye um and he he has this way of dressing which is especially he basically borrows clothes from his victims so i think the guy in the store he kind of steals his hat from him and he wears them like yeah. he's sort of he's young as well like marin and he's kind of trying on these different identities so there's this sort of idea of costume and sort of they're both mm-hmm. they're both performing being functional members of society, but it just doesn't fit all together. Like his clothes, it's sort of misshapen, it sort of covers something up. So they're they're two young people that can kind of recognise that um you know, that they're they're past the kind of I don't know, I get a sense that Marin's past is sort of it's it's a blank past because she she doesn't know her mother and she also doesn't seem to be able to remember some of the prior episodes she's had where she's attacked people and then lee has this past which is a blank but it's kind of because it's full of ghosts that he needs to come to terms with he's been running away from something so they i think they see a lot of themselves in each other and not just because they both happen to like eating people there's that natural yeah that natural chemistry there and i think it's a i mean it is it's on and off screen i think these two actors and these two characters they do have a really beautiful chemistry i think mm. it works off the bat and if this if this pairing hadn't worked on screen it's it's kind of like call me by your name isn't it it's like if it doesn't work if it hadn't worked the whole thing just would have been blown apart and they kind of bond as they bond as outsiders and they're trying to kind of create this sort of family unit or trying to kind of try on being people as Mm -hmm. Baron call it when they're together yeah and uh, there is something very sad you know while Sully is a very creepy character you don't really feel sorry for him there is something very sad I think when it comes to Lee like he has this sweet relationship with his sister and I guess like I feel like with Lee, the character of Lee, there is this most overt metaphor of the cannibalism being essentially addiction, right? That's kind of what it feels yeah. like. It's it's almost like you, you know, it reminded me almost a bit of like the Jared Leto character in Requiem for a Dream or these characters that mm-hmm. can't help, but they want to come back to their family and they want to function in society, but they keep getting drawn away again. And this this idea that yeah. His sister is used to him disappearing for weeks at a time and then coming home again and he, he he kind of returns to normal and he wants to function as normal, but then he can't help himself. He has to go back on the road again and do what he needs to do, right? And you get this kind of push-pull, mm. this really sad element to him where he, he wants to be a good brother and, like you say, a, a functioning member of society. But for him, it is just this addiction that he can't, he can't get rid of essentially right and it's too taboo to get help with an addiction like that that's the thing yeah 
Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. And he kind of, I mean, he look he looks like an addict, you know, in a stereotypical yeah. way, obviously. Yes. But he does because he's kind of skinny and scrawny and, again, badly fitting clothes. And he's, as you say, he's constantly on the, he's, he's coming back and forth from home. And he, he has this kind of openness about him with Marin. Like he's not... Um, not that he's in, not embarrassed, but he he is just kind of quite uh, you know frank and open with her. But at the same time, she discovers you know through this sort of journey together that he can absolutely turn on the charm when he needs to yes, to get yes. something out of people, and that's so much like you know that's what an addict has to do as well. They have to charm people to get exactly what they need, and then they turn you know they can turn on you. It's kind of predator and prey once more. And and as with all of Luca's movies as well, I think there is like a there's a queer element to this film too right and for David the screenwriter he he kind of talks about in his mind you know because he said growing up as a a gay guy in the midwest he, he said it, it 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 brought to mind more of kind of that idea for him of being like maybe a closeted gay guy or you know finding your community of people and it being treated as taboo in some regard but i think you know as we go on i think we get that when we meet the michael stuhlberg and david gordon green characters a bit too but mm. it, it feels like there is these kind of those kind of elements coming into play as well as the film goes on right oh yeah absolutely absolutely mm. and we'll i'm sure we'll talk about the kind of the 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 carnival the fair um and how yes. that kind of all ties together too yeah 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 definitely um and yeah so lee and lee and uh, marin sort of go off on the road together once they find each other basically right and 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 this is when the movie does become like a classic kind of road movie and like yeah. you know i think there's always something kind of I really love this kind of genre of road movies, right? And there's something about them that I think there's always something inherently quite satisfying and that works really well for film. You know, when you think of some of the best road movies like Little Miss Sunshine or The Straight Story or Thelma and Louise or whatever, yeah. like what is it about road movies, do you think, that kind of works so well with, with, with in cinema? Uh, I mean, t- do you know what? When when I saw this film, the first two films I thought of, um, I mean, there were mm. sort of Thelma and Louise and things like that, but was, I thought of Badlands. Badlands, um, which- yes. Yeah. yeah, which I, I had seen for the first time last year, actually. And I was kind of thinking of Sissy Spacek and Taylor Russell and that kind of... And Near Dark as well, which you, you know, you mentioned vampirism. It made me think of that yes. um, as well. But it's that... I mean, it's, it's, it's really cliche to say, but it's, you know, it's not... It's not the literal journey, is it? It's the emotional journey. It's the, yeah. it's the people you meet on the way... Um, and that kind of personal growth and that sense of sort of developing that developing identity and sort of your your identity being reflected your experiences being reflected in the kind of the landscapes around you so I think there's a lot to be said in this film about it's kind of timeless in a lot of ways but it's also specific so it's you know it's late 80s and it's sort of there's a lot to be gleaned from the sort of Reagan era, sort of midwest, midwestern, sorry, setting. That kind of yeah, the fact that they're sort of travelling through these kind of flyover states. It's quite working class, mm. you know. I think, um, and Lee and Lee and Marin are both sort of clearly working class as well. So you know, when Marin's dad leaves, she's left with nothing except sort of money to get the Greyhound bus. And so they're journeying through these small yeah. rural communities of America and they're kind of they're quite humble farming communities. Um and they're they're the communities that have been left behind when other parts of America are sort of clearly flourishing. So there's not you you've got these young people who are already sort of existing on the fringes of middle class sort of American society, but their experiences worsened by the need to feed on humans. But <laughs> yes. I mean if they if they weren't cannibals, would they have much going for them anyway because of where they are? And it's kind of it's all reflected. There's a few there's quite a few sort of um shots where you get like a fade of the landscape into kind of Marin or Lee and you get that sense mm. of sort of the landscape reflecting their sort of, you know, their personal journeys as well as their literal yeah. ones but it's kind of I don't know it kind of beautifully ties together yeah I think you're so right about that and there is like definitely a sort of class element to it isn't it I mean I guess it is it is almost quite a quite literal kind of like eat the rich type story in a oh, lot of yeah. ways although there's not yeah. many overtly rich people that they eat but it is definitely mm. that idea of these cannibals sort of living off the land and living off the people and like you say taking clothing and taking what they need Mm. from people as and when and just sort of drifting through life in that regard yeah um and then so 
Let's talk about the the really weird, creepy sequence where we meet Michael Stuhlberg and <sighs> David Gordon Green as well. Because again, this is just like a single scene out of nowhere, right? And this is such a bizarre moment. And I think one of the creepiest moments for me in the film as well. <laughs> freaky. It's so freaky. And I don't know about you, but I'd I'd forgotten that Michael Stuhlberg was in this. Yes. Um, and when I was in the cinema and you get to the point where you've got, yeah, Michael Stuhlberg as Jake and then David Gordon Green, randomly. Really weird. Yeah. Yeah. I, for ages, I did not recognise Michael Stuhlberg at all. No. He looks so no. different. And I have that, you know, <laughs> lovely memory of him as um, Elio's father in Call Me By Your Name and that like lovely, amazing, like heart warming breaking monologue he gives at the end and then the monologue he gives in this is like the complete opposite it's such a sort of mm-hmm. like it's such a physical transformation it that kind of shocked me in and of itself yes oh they're just fucked up aren't they there's just some there's this horrible horrible unease this sense of tension and this sense of something really awful about to happen with this pair out in the yeah. middle of nowhere and they're looking at Marin and Lee like they want to eat them. Everyone's looking at everyone like they want to eat them, but they do. And he kind of, Jake gives this speech about the ultimate act being to eat someone whole and sort of an eater reaches their Bones and all. Yeah, bones and all, the sort of namesake of the film. Um, Yeah, and how an eater reaches their full form um, when they've eaten someone like that. It's kind of a rite of passage. And it's just... I don't know, you're just waiting for something truly, truly awful to happen. Mm-hmm. And that kind of getaway is, yeah, it's it's such a fine, like, you're just, I was so convinced that it was going to end. Badly. Horribly. <laughs> yeah. And again, do they do they do anything that's that bad? They haven't actually, no. they don't actually do anything, do no. they? No. And but am I right in thinking as well that David Gordon Green's character, Brad, is sort of not a cannibal but is somebody that is kind of like getting into it he's almost like a kind of they're almost like yeah a groupie it's like a vampire and a familiar almost or something right like and they are this weird and also you think are they a couple you you just don't really know what their deal is from the beginning and yeah this this thing with cannibals bumping into other cannibals which happens a lot in this film uh that that like (laughs) they're everywhere (laughs) who knew that there were so many but yeah the Yes, that they it's almost like they seem to have this code where they wouldn't eat each other, but also you think, well, actually they probably would if they needed to eat, they will eat each other at the drop of a hat as well, right? So there is this bubbling tension every time we bump into these other characters like this. Um and it is a scene that sort of goes nowhere. Like like you say, it doesn't actually come to anything in the end, but it is so chilling and suspenseful. And what a great like ten minutes of screen performing from uh, Michael Stuhlberg in that scene, you know? So good. Oh, it's it's amazing. But it really is like thus far in this journey, it's like a series of very untrustworthy older men. Yes. Where you're like, yes. Marin, just stay away from the older dudes. Like, they're all really, they're total creeps in this. It's really freaky. <laughs> yeah. And then we get that sequence, you alluded to this earlier, but when they go to the sort of carnival, right? And this is when they basically sort of prearrange that they have to feed and that Lee, Timothy Chalamet's character, basically sort of goes off sort of cruising basically but he sort of goes off yeah. on the prowl for somebody to 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 eat and he has this moment with this man who works at the carnival they arrange to meet later i think this man is supposed to be married right and he kind of sneaks off mm-hmm. and they meet in this cornfield and then sort of what begins as sex ends up in him being eaten essentially but again like what did you think of this whole sequence at the carnival i mean it certainly serves as a warning to marin doesn't it that everything Mm. might not be as it seems and that it kind of shows that lee can be manipulative and he can be a clever predator and he's doing he's doing something without her he's keeping secrets um, and he knows how to trick people to get what he wants again Mm. um and the thing i almost find the most alarming about this scene is that Lee kind of justifies his actions by saying, you know, we kill people that people won't miss. Like no one's going to miss him. Mm -hmm. And there's almost like a homophobic element there that, you know, 
Lee's, uh, Lee's like, you know, this, you know, this guy's queer, you mm-hmm. know, he's that, that very kind of, this guy's queer. So no one's gonna, no one's gonna miss him. He's a carnival guy. Like no one's gonna miss him. And of yes. course they then find, not that it matters, obviously, but they then find that he has, he's married, he has a family, but it kind of also ties into what you alluded to earlier that there is a kind of, there's a, there's a sexual fluidity to, to Lee, mm-hmm. but also to Marin, um, with that kind of sleepover scene. Yeah. Um, to uh, Jake and Brad mm-hmm. and their relationship together. Um, and it has that, like vampirism again. There's yeah, the kind it's very of vampire. Sexual, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, sexual subtext to cannibalism. It kind of it really lends itself to a queer reading because the consumption of sort of another person feels again so intimate. But it's yeah. Yeah, it's a, uh, and that's quite a violent scene as well, isn't it? Oh my god, it is. It is yeah. really violent, and 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 it's creepy because it's happening in this dark cornfield that's kind of lit by headlights. And don't trust the corn. Never trust the corn. Never, never. trust the corn. But at, but at that point, you find yourself very much rooting for these two lead characters, right? Yeah. Who were doing pretty unspeakable things. But I was like, oh my god, quickly get away before his family find out what's happened, you know, as well. And it's like, hang on, I should not be rooting for this guy. But you kind of are by this they're, point. They're, tra- they're kind of trying, aren't they? Because you're right, they do... They're trying to live... They're trying to set some sort of moral code for themselves because they have no choice. And mm-hmm. um, Marin's very much the moral... She feels like she has, you know, the stronger moral compass. She can't kill people, basically, herself. Like, she's struggling yeah. so much. Lee kind of has to do it for her. So they're, you know, they're helping each other to survive, but they have to build this kind of... This moral code for themselves because they can't live by society's normal standards so they're trying their best they're trying yeah and there's a moment isn't there when Marin then leaves Lee like she kind of abandons him um and that's kind of because she's having a bit of a sort of conscience a crisis of conscience I think isn't Mm. she about the whole thing and that maybe she and Lee are again it comes back to the idea of them being like addicts but it's it's like they're enabling each other aren't they essentially and Marin very much you know wants to stop and um and so Mm. she sort of abandons him and then there's this kind of section where she goes off and she goes to find her mother right and there's that again chilling encounter where she finds her mother who is kind of locked up in a sort of psychiatric facility essentially right because her mother also a cannibal and, and essentially can't control herself so got herself locked up in a cell essentially right and and is just mm. and is just going to be there forever because that and, and it's 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 quite bleak because it's kind of insinuating that like if you have this thing this you know this this uh, desire there's nothing you can do about it apart from lock yourself away in yeah. a room essentially kind know? of the it's like the worst case scenario isn't it marin's you know, I'm sure she's, you know, you hope on that kind of journey, you're hoping to find your mother mm. and it's all okay and she understands you and, you know, and she, what she discovers is that, you know, there is a kind of almost genetic link between her cannibalism and her mother. She can see, you know, where it comes from. Her mother was the same. Mm. She still doesn't know why she does it or why they all do it, but, you know, it's it's there. But instead of this sort of moment of reconnection and finding each other, she just finds that her, yeah, her mum has it's almost like a mirror kind of worst case scenario. This is what your future could be like. Isn't it sort of implied that she's maybe eaten her own arms? Yes. I think that's it, right. I mean, she's got no arms, right? Yeah. Mortifying. It yeah. Is. It's a real moment of, it's that body horror that we were talking about from Suspiria and kind of it's, yeah, it's really, really hard to see. And it's just such a, it's the, you know, it's the opposite to the payoff that you'd hope for that she'd mm-hmm. find this sense of, herself and her sense of you know the daughter coming back to the mother and it's just completely lost um i'm interested that the because this this film is adapted from a ya novel and Mm. I, i haven't read the novel and i couldn't find out much about it beforehand but it did say that in the book marin doesn't know her father and she she's left abandoned by her mother and yeah so i imagine that maybe that scene with Chloe Sevigny doesn't happen in the book, but it, mm, yeah, interesting, interesting sort of switching dynamics I get if you're, you, if you're sort of going for your, trying to find the father figure rather than the mother figure, because it does, yeah. again, it's a bit stereotypical, but it does feel just particularly 
I don't know, ghouling yes. that she'd find her mother like this and not get the sort of maternal acceptance that she's hoping for. Agreed. Yeah. And I think, again, it's just this chance to cast Chloe Sevigny as this kind of <laughs> quite um, quite scary mother, because in We Are Who oh We Are, God. she's quite a scary mother figure in that too, right? Where there were times when I was like, yeah. this woman's fucking not or not okay and we are who we right. are as well you know and uh she's right. got that I'd forgotten she was in that yeah. yeah she's that kind of you know scary military mother isn't she in, in that and, and like yeah the she's very good Chloe Sevigny isn't she she's very intense and she can go from being quite warm to being terrifying or aggressive like on a dime yeah. as well you know it's really good and she doesn't have a single line in this no film, that's right which is a you know credit to the power of her performance but also, you know, going back to that kind of good faith thing, like Chloe Sevigny, she's a big actress and she's like, I will be in this film whether I have a line or not. I know. And I, I guess... I love to be in it, but it's... Yeah. And I guess I was going to say, I guess because of the nature of this film, the structure of it is that most of these actors probably only had to come on and do one day each, right? It's almost like it's like each person gets their own little section and that's it, you know? So it's probably low commitment for most of them. <laughs> but yeah. Sounds wonderful, so doesn't good. it? Exactly. Probably, probably a lovely job for them all, yeah. Um, and then that's sort of it right and then we get to that final sequence where she goes back to lee and the two of them then kind of there's like a little montage isn't there isn't there of them kind of trying to have a normal life they get like a little apartment together and you know like things seem to be on the up and then this terrifying moment when she arrives home one day lee is not there and uh sully has caught up with her and is waiting for her right in her apartment and it's just and is this the moment you were alluding to earlier with the drool yeah i think this is the drooly bit which just i don't know what it is about that single line of drool that just oh, that was if it's... if i were her that would honestly have finished me off it's scarier than yeah the entirety of the rest of the film but it's yeah it's this sense of oh god i mean it feels it kind of feels inevitable in a way like they've tried I think Marin says at some point, like, you know, let's try and be people. They're trying to do, you know, the the acceptable, mm-hmm. the normal, the normal thing that couples do where they have a, ha- a flat and they live together and they're, you know, trying to go it normal, not eat each other, all of that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And Sully was, <laughs> Sully was always destined to come back in a way. But yeah, she's kind of left. She's alone without Lee. Um, and... Yeah, again, you get that sense of, is Sully going to assault her? Yeah. It feels, is he going to eat her? Is he going to do something else to her? It's really, yeah. it's almost unbearable to watch, isn't it? It is, it is. And like, well, I just like th- th- that poor, th- those two actors. I mean, that must have been a very awkward scene to film. It's so up close and personal. And the way that he's like on top of her, like you say, drooling on her, it is terrifying. And you're right. There's something so inevitable. I guess that's what the film is saying to us over and over again, that this is leading to somewhere bad like with the Chloe Sevigny yeah, it's moment not subtle, it's but... not subtle like I think there's a really great cro- uh, great quote from Leila Latif um, who reviewed it and said that she put bones and all is a fundamentally beautifully realised and devastating tragic romance which at multiple moments would have Chekhov himself weeping as the trigger is inevitably pulled <laughs> and it's true right it's yeah, like Sully is like the so Chekhov's true. gun that, that comes back for us at the end and they have this oh they yeah it ha- they have this you know this fight which is um i mean i struggle to believe two scrappy young people could win over mark rylance but um but they have to give it some welly and they do they do manage to you know kill him in this really again really tense Mm -hmm. horrific scene um it's not the camera doesn't shy away from the violence there and then and then lee is injured and again that kind of feels inevitable too like they were never going to be able to they were never going to be able to make it together, were they? No, exactly. It all comes to a very sad, inevitable, tragic end, doesn't it? <laughs> and then, yeah, Lee is left for dead. And we I don't think we see it overtly, but I think we're led to assume that basically she, Marin, probably ate him, maybe ate both of them, and then just sort of headed off yeah. by herself, right? And it's like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He kind of, 
he begs he begs Marin to eat him while she's kind of weeping. And this was the only bit that I almost I didn't laugh because it's all very serious. <laughs> but I almost laughed because I was just I don't know, it's just so I just two it's teenagers being like, No, eat me. I know. Just eat this me. is where we're into yeah, like just... YA like Twilight Twilight yeah. territory, aren't we? Yeah. It's true. <laughs> we totally are. But <laughs> Lee kind of he knows that his body will help Marin to survive, especially because you know, she struggles to kill people. So actually there's a, a practical element there. Mm. Um, and then there's almost like that, um, there's almost that vampiric element as well of sort of consuming the blood and the flesh of the person you love most. Yes. And that being like the most desirous thing in the world. Yes. Like, you know, eating your significant other would be like the best meal ever. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then... And then in short, yeah, Marin becomes, it sort of harks back to that speech that Jake was giving about bones and all. Marin becomes a kind of, becomes fully herself, yes. sort of finds herself and completes that journey from girl to woman. That sounds, yeah. well, I mean, it's true though. Yeah. Uh, by kind of consuming him, bones and all. Oh God, it's fucked up, isn't it? It's fucked up. <laughs> yeah. Don't you love it though? I love it so much. And also there's another thing that we didn't mention, but there's this thing where Sully... <laughs> Sully is collecting hair from the people he's killed. Oh my killed. god, I forgot about the hair rope. <laughs> the hair rope. And isn't there a reveal at the end that he may have killed Lee's sister as well? Like, it, uh, am I imagining that? Or oh, wait. Did, 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 <laughs> I don't know whether I read this in a particular way. Oh my god, way. I can't remember that. But I think oh, there's no. a moment at the end when they look at the hair and they realise that he may have tracked <gasps> down Lee's family and killed his sister. I don't know. Uh, people can write in if I'm completely wrong about that, but I, mean, I think I read that in a certain way. You might be way. right, yeah. and that's even that's even worse. Yeah. <laughs> that's even worse. Oh my god, that hair. This the hair. I, yeah, that needs like a whole. It's kind of this weird. Again, it's like, is it a uh, is it a sort of um, a way for Sully to kind of commemorate his victims, Mm -hmm. like a sign of remembrance. Mm -hmm. Or is it something, is it basically like a Jeffrey Dahmer style? Yeah, yeah. Gleeful trophy. A trophy killing. Which one is it? Yeah, I know. It's It's fucking minging. It's very creepy, isn't it? And again, there's just something about hair, particularly human hair. It's just, it's really gross. It's all matted and you could have given it a good brush. It needs like a good condition, I think. That's the thing. Like you can almost sort of smell this film, can't you? You can smell it. It's stinky. (laughs) It's stinky. (laughs) You can tell who smells good and who smells bad in this film. Absolutely. Absolutely, absolutely. And there's not many characters that probably smell good, to be honest. There's not many of no. them. Um, so there you go. I mean, that's that. And that's sort of it, right? I mean, it's this like, it's quite a, yeah. it, it's, it's a, it's a bleak ending, but it's, uh, it's very moving. It is like very, very it sad is. at the end, isn't it? It is. I mean, I was, I was bawling, but that I always <laughs> bawl at these films. Yeah. So that doesn't say much, but I was having a little, had a little tear at the end. Um, and I mean, let's just assume there's so it's a, clearly so many bloody cannibals out there oh that uh, hopefully she'll find someone else. They're everywhere. I know. Is she going to get, yeah. Is she going to go off, find another cannibal and keep eating people? Is she going to go lock herself in a cell like her mother? Like, and that's all kind of left open, I suppose, isn't it? Does but, she become vegetarian? Yeah. Does she like get, the Cullen Like the family? Cullens. She should go find the Cullen family. That's what she should do. Practice a bit of abstinence, Marin. Come on. Right? Um, <laughs> this is actually a film about veganism. So. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. I love it. Well, there you go. Um, I, I'm, I'm already excited to give this film another watch. Where does this, where does this rank for you amongst Luca's other films generally, Let's Death, would you say? Ooh. Do you know what? I hadn't thought about that at all. Um, I, ooh. I think it ranks quite highly, you know. Mm. I mean, I think Call Me By Your Name is probably number one yeah. still. Um, this might rank second. Yeah, it's kind of up there for me as well. I think. I think it's. Um, I think it's better than Suspiria for me. Actually, like, yeah. Yeah. Did you you liked Suspiria? Didn't I you? did like it, but I, I would say that, mm. like, for me, there were there were chunks of it that I thought were brilliant, like genius, some yeah. of the best stuff I've seen, and then there were other chunks where I'm like. You could have lifted that out and it would have made no yeah. difference. In fact, it would have made the film better, right? Because it's quite a long film and there were huge plot strands in that film 
with certain characters that I thought I don't care about this but uh, I basically loved everything that went on with the girls in the dance school and I didn't like most of the other stuff that happened outside of that essentially you know cut the cut yeah absolutely I'm totally with you on that it felt a bit baggy didn't it in some places but but yeah I always still I've I always want to rewatch it. Yes. I keep thinking, like, oh, I need to rewatch that. And then I'm like, I, I watched it six months ago. I don't need to watch it again. But I do keep thinking that I want to rewatch it. So it's obviously. Yeah. He does I mean, a good. I'm glad he's leaning into the horror films here. I love it. I know. And, uh, you know, I, uh, you're right. I haven't been back to Suspiria much, but I do listen to the Tom York music quite a lot still, oh, you know? And again, there's something about Lucas amazing films. Amazing soundtrack. Yeah. Something about Lucas films where it's like the vibe the music is almost just as enjoyable as the film itself. Do you know what I mean? The vibes, yeah. Maybe we'll be listening to like the Bones and All soundtrack next summer when we're... I don't know, driving through the countryside. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, there we go. Well, um, Steph, it's been lovely to have you here not talking about five terrible films for once. Yeah. So thank you so much for, for coming back. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me. I cannot believe we led with Steph really likes Timothy Chalamet and Harry Styles, though, because that's like killed any any form of credibility I had. You're going to have emails being like, you can't have this girl on again. No, but no. No, thank you for having me. It's been an absolute absolute blast i've loved talking about this film it's been so good and just remind people where they can find you and more of your if they want to come and hear more of steph talk about timothy chalamet where can they find it oh god um you can find me on the thirst which is a pop culture podcast Mm -hmm. we talk about film and tv and music and all of that jazz um and then you can also find me on twitter if twitter's still there uh (laughs) steph x mckenna amazing steph thank you very much thank you very much And that's it for our bonus episode on Bones and All. Thank you so much for listening and a big thank you to my brilliant guest, Steph McKenna. And of course, a huge thank you to the writer of Bones and All, David Kajanich, for his brilliant insights. Uh, So I would love to hear your thoughts. What did you all make of Bones and All? Did you love it as much as Steph and I? Or are you a little bit more on the fence? I would love to hear your thoughts. Don't forget, you can email me, evolutionofhorror at gmail.com. You can also find us on all the socials, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Instagram and Letterboxd. We also have a Patreon channel, patreon.com slash evolution of horror, where you'll get regular bonus episodes if you donate either five or ten dollars per month. And if you are listening to this podcast for the first time, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and join us for new episodes every single week. A new episode will drop every Friday, and we'll be back this Friday to continue our vampire series. I'll be joined by Michael Leader and Maha Al Badrawi to discuss Only Lovers Left Alive from 2013 and a girl walks home alone at night from 2014 join us then for all of this and more on the evolution of horror